I talk, this is on theatre. Um, and the reason why it's on theatre is because the topic for the XX is some things you don't know about me. And in case you guys didn't know um, how pretentious I am, now you know. <laughs> theatre! So, um, before we do anything, it's my first XX. And so I thought, I, I'm nervous, so I need to like warm up. And you guys are going to join me oh, in a theater yeah. exercise. Yeah. Am I right, guys? Yeah, come on. Uh, uh, I'm on your camera. I can't do that. No, Pat, you're getting in here. <laughs> so we, it's going to be very easy, though. I know that some of you, like obviously, the theater games and stuff, which people do before um, before plays and before rehearsing stuff and stuff like that. There's a lot of different types. Uh, some of them um, are similar to singing, in which you go like, like make really loud noises, like. And like have like use the diaphragm and stuff like that, and then it works in your projection. There's other ones that focus on improv, but um, that a too long and b like you know um, if you if you're a little <laughs> hey if you're a little if if you're not very good at um, drama or you're very nervous about you know improv improvisation, you can just like you know not do this. So instead, we're gonna do a game called Twenty One. Now, as you guys to all get up here, camera can stay on. I don't care. Everybody go get in the circle. No, Pat, get in the circle. <laughs> okay. So, this is a great metaphor, you guys, for how the different components of the theatre and all the actors have to work together in order to make a play good, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, because this game relies very much on being a team. Okay, so everybody, everybody get in the circle. This isn't a circle, guys. This is a semicircle. Yes. Come Pat, on, you're not in the circle. Come, yeah. yeah. really come, yeah. come, come over here. Come over here. Come on, this is not a circle. This is a yeah, weird block. You're participating in this no, exact, whether this you like it or not. Okay, so for the people who are at home, why would you be watching this? <laughs> <laughs> so look. Skip this bit. It's, it's boring. Basically, basically, what you do you is get everybody get get, get in closer. <laughs> okay, get in closer. Not that close. <laughs> okay, so you stare at the floor. Leave space for Jesus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this game is called 21. What you do is you stare at the floor, you don't look at anybody else, and we all have to, as a group, count to 21. Now the rules are um, you have to, uh, so you can't say one, um, two numbers consecutively. It has to be different people every time, and you can't say it at the same time as another per person. Otherwise, you start we again. start again. Okay, so for example, I'd say one, and then maybe maybe Tom would say two, two and then Pat would say it at the same time, like a dick, <laughs> and then we'd all have to start again, okay? Okay. And if we get to 21, we win. So I'll do this a couple of times, depending on how good we are at this. Let's go. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Mmm. Fifteen. Fifteen. Isn't that consecutive? No, I'm saying, I'm saying listen, second Listen, listen. Don't do that shit. Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you broke the first rule. Don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Wheaton's Law applies to every game, yeah. guys. Okay, so. Okay. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Guys! <laughs> <laughs> nice. Focus! Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. to warm yourself up. There's a bunch of others. I might play some if we have time at the end and I pull too fast. Improv. So yeah. Im yeah, improv, improv. Uh. Um, so, we've, we're all warmed up. Let's get into the history of theatre and stuff like that. Now, the history of theatre, like, there's a bit of, like, dodginess where it, when it comes to, like, the actual roots. A lot of people say, like, or, um, it like traces back to ancient rituals and stuff, which had dances and stuff like that. 
But the thing that everyone thinks of is Greek theatre, Greek stuff. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so, in as everyone, as most people know, hopefully, um, there are three types of Greek theatre. Um, there is comedy. Yes, comedy. And so, com um, comedy. One of the ba um, biggest people, playwrights in, com in Greek comedy, was Aristophanes. That guy. And there were also three types of comedy, which is interesting, things people don't know. Um, the older one was the kind of political, satirical stuff that we say, see today in like The Chaser, for example. And it was very, you know, political and satirical. Pretty soft, slam. There was also middle, middle comedy, which kind of happened in between the ages of the old and new comedy. Um, middle comedy was very similar, but didn't actually impersonate people. Instead, it was a bit more like, like, rather than the, like, the jokes being political, they were more personal, so I'd say they'd probably be more about characters and the like. So, and, your, um, so your mother jokes would be in there? Probably, hey. Although, we'll get to, you will get to your mother jokes, um, but... Oh god, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> and there was new comedy, which is very similar to situational comedy nowadays. So, instead of how it, it's, instead of, it focuses more on, like, everyday life kind of thing. And the guy for that um, is not on my notes, but I believe his name was like Manan Manamina. Great, good. I love that. <laughs> I know, right? Same. Best guy. Okay. <laughs> um, they also had tragedy. Yeah. So tragedy was pretty structured. In fact, so was comedy, I think. But there was um, um, in everything there was a prologue where the narrator it turned up and was like, "This is the shit that's going down. Everyone's gonna die. Let's go." <laughs> then, then that was, you then had something called a paradox where the story kind of unfolded, so, um, yeah, the story unfolded. And then there was also, and then that would be in, interspersed by um, Stasima, which are like choral interludes, and that's where the chorus would come in, because in Greek, in Greek theatre, there was a chorus. And, they, and those people would kind of like, you know, come into the play and they'd inter intersperse it through musical instruments and tell you what was going on, basically. Um, they were also the people who usually wore masks, and the mask, um, there's going to be a, pic a picture of masks in a second. And they all, uh, and the masks generally revealed like the character's sex, their age and their status, but some sometimes it also kind of allowed the actors to change different roles. And in comedy it could be particularly like jarring, because um, of the really exaggerated facial expressions. I guess in comedy it could be funny because of the really exaggerated facial expressions, but you know. And then there was, finally, um, satire comedy, which some people... No. Wrong laptop! Satire comedy! <laughs> which... Which um, was... The existence of this is debated, but it's, um, it's basically like a tragic comic thing. It's got a lot of phallic imagery, it's very sexualized, and it's got like, it's kind of similar to, the, to today's burlesque. So that is sad there, comedy. And here is a picture of a mask. Whoa. Isn't that great, guys? Doesn't that inspire fear or laughter? It's adorable. I know! <laughs> <laughs> so, what is wrong with you? Moving on, I'm gonna very briefly cover the topic that everybody learned throughout the entirety of high school. Which is Shakespeare! Am I right? Did that, did that do the... Yeah. Did that do the animation? Yeah, I did the thing! Good. Good. It's your... Good. So... Shakespeare... Yes! Yeah! That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, you know, like, this is, this is pretty standard, and I think we've all learned this in school. There were three types of, um, broadly, three types of plays that Shakespeare did. Comedy, history, um, and tragedy. So, actually similar to the Greek plays, in that they had comedy and history. Um, comedy and tragedy. Um, history's boring though. And then um, it was characterized by, um, I'd say the, the most prevalent things in, the, in Shakespeare were the things like there was a complete lack of um, direction for props, which is really unusual compared to like modern day stuff. And, and so that was probably because um, Shakespeare was often used um, in traveling theaters, which like, you, don't, you can't carry that many props. That would be so boring. And then there were also things like soliloquies, which everyone knows, and rhyming couplets. 
and just really great things with language. And soliloquies. <laughs> also, you're, the, you're saying words. I... What is a soliloquy? So, what is a soliloquy? A, silo a soliloquy is, you know, to be or not to be. You know? That's a soliloquy. Yeah. So it's where the it's kind of like a character's like monologue, and it's depending on how Shakespeare is interpreted. You could either say that it's something they are saying to themselves, or they're saying directly to the audience by breaking down the fourth wall, which we'll get to later. Um, but they, and um, it generally just reveals the character's thoughts and intentions. Hamlet. Which to be or not to be is from has a shit ton of soliloquies and they show you so much about what a whiny little bitch Hamlet is. So, <laughs> example, example. Um, so yeah, oh, the other thing about it's acting. <laughs> so the other thing about um, Shakespeare was that um, a lot of people think you know he was really, really boring and re and a lot of people nowadays are like oh Shakespeare's so highbrow and stuff mm. and it's true like. He did, like, there were bits where he very clearly just wrote for the aristocracy, like the entirety of Richard III, like the Tudors hated Richard III, so his play was just like, Richard III, am I right? Hate that guy. When in reality, like, it wasn't actually really knowing whether he killed his kids, um, his nephews. He convinced and, the wife of the guy. And he was actually a pretty eye king, so, you know, who cares if he killed kids? Um, <laughs> you and this is being filmed. <laughs> this is being filmed. I don't mean that, future employers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what was I saying? But, um, so but the thing yeah. about the thing about Shakespeare's theatre stuff is that when he uh, um, when he performed his plays, he was either traveling around the globe, and the globe, where well, it had like upper class people in the seats, it also had like standing seats. The people in the middle. By the way, with Greek stuff, um, theatre was always free, so, but you had the better seats for the rich people, and the audience would get very angry. They'd throw stones if your play was shit. <laughs> so I know, brutal. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> wow. um, but yeah, no. Um, as a result, Shakespeare just has like a shit ton of dick jokes. These are just a few of just some really great sexual innuendos. For example, this one, cunt. Tree matters, which is from, which is from Hamlet, where he lies in Hamlet's lap, and she's like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh, did you think I was thinking of cut tree matters?" <laughs> and, like, and you know, this is from Romeo and Juliet, from Mercutio, my favorite Shakespeare character of all time, and this is a your mother joke <laughs> from from Titus Andronicus. <laughs> it's amazing. It's the best. <laughs> Can you read it out? So, unfortunately, I've forgotten what became, uh, came before this. It was something about like how how um, his mom was like all that or something, and then he they replied, "Villain, I have done thy mother. Amazing." Okay. So now that we've gotten all of this nice, beautiful foundation, and everybody understands Grecian theatre and Shakespeare in depth. Um, we're gonna get to the stuff that I actually know. So, realism. Now, this is the this is the like genre of theatre that a lot of people know. So, in between, there were a lot of play styles that I skipped in this time, including Commedia dell'arte, which had very set characters that were all stereotypes, and there was a lot of stuff that was travelling theatre. So, it was really farcical, which means like. It, it was often a form of comedy that pe characters routinely broke down the fourth wall um, by just speaking to their audience. And they just. Um, and it was just basically like all these stereotypical characters, and then everything went wrong, and then oh no kind of thing. And there was a lot of audience like yelling at them and stuff like that. Um, realism evolved as a reaction to this. So realism is what you kind of see the modern players being today, usually, I'd say. Um, and the main playwrights were Ibsen, who wrote A Doll's House, if anyone studied that in school, Hedda Gabler, The Wild Duck, a bunch of great things, and Tennessee Williams, who wrote Street Calm and Desire, among other things. And the um, great thing about realism is, can somebody make like a really loud like explosion sound? Because I couldn't get PowerPoint to do this. <laughs> no! Wait! <laughs> Wait, guys! <laughs> Three, two, one! 
<sighs> Good, that's what we're talking about. So, the main thing about realism is that it established a fourth wall. So, a fourth wall, in case nobody knows, is just a wall, an um, imaginary wall in between you and the audience. So the characters never talk to the audience. The characters in realism might even face, not face the audience. Which initially in drama is a giant no-no, but in realism it's okay because essentially it's supposed to be like fly on the wall theatre. You're supposed and it's it's supposed to be realistic. People don't talk like this to people, like, hey, how you going? People talk, you know, to each other like that. And so you'll have um, as a result some some good realist techniques are like completely not completely talking to a character with like like, with their back to the, to the audience, may and just... It was, it's just a way to make it seem more realistic and just more... Yeah. I forgot where I was going with this. It also had a lot of very, very complicated sets. It was, he was a lot more... It, that was very different to um, theatre before that, because, you know, travelling theatre groups. Not many props. And so in these you had really complicated sets, and they often had things called like objects of tension. Tension was a huge thing in, in realism. Um, so if you've ever seen a realist play, and that's just anything that you think looks like a soap opera is a realist play. Um, there's a huge... you'll have huge pauses between characters where they build up tension. You generally have the main character, in Ibsen it's mainly a woman, go through a journey where she's kind of opp um, oppressed by this middle class society. And you'll, um, where was I going for this? Objects of tension. So you'll generally have some, every time um, somebody's feeling conflict or something, they'll go toward that object. For example, in the doll's house, there was a stove in the stage directions. And every time Nora felt kind of subjugated or didn't know what to do or something like that, she went towards the stove, which was kind of like, and as a result for that, that kind of like whenever you kind of pick up on it, so that whenever they go to that uh, that object, it kind of like it not only shows the divide between what the other character they're talking to, because most likely the character will be over there, but it kind of creates a recurring theme, and it kind of get, gets you to know what they're what they're feeling inside. As I said before, as well. By the way, wine is a very, probably a very realist thing because it's such a soap, a soap opera all the time. Um, Nina, yes. What sort of time period did this get started? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so Ibsen started in Norway. Let me just look at my notes real quick. Notes or Google? Nineteenth <laughs> <laughs> century. I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yep, yep, late 19th century, mainly. Cool. To early 20th. Yeah. That's what I would guess. T.Y. So, and, and I'm pretty sure Ibsen was in Norway, but I might be wrong with that. Tennessee Williams was American. So... <laughs> am I right? So, yeah. Um, with the characters? This is a beautiful, stereotypical, uh, realist lady lady. Um, she's basically generally somebody, like in Hedda Garbo and Doll's House, where she's kind of trapped in this very, um, kind of medial, is that the set word I'm looking for? Kind of very, very middle class and often very materialistic existence, yearning for something more. Um, generally there's like, you know, an oppressive husband figure, an oppressive something. And it's and it's trying to get out of of that mold of this because it was also Ibsen trying to I say Ibsen but you know other realist playwrights right trying to show that middle class existence and upper class existence as perfect as they looked they weren't actually they had fl uh, very huge flaws and they had um, you know it was a very flawed existence so hashtag not all middle class I guess. Realism. So that's realism. You'll see that a lot in a lot. If you go to a if you go to a theater, you most likely see a realist play. I'd reckon uh, if it's not an independent theater, or they'll do it in a realist style. 
because it's very um, the th good thing about realism is that you get very involved in it so you get you get so wrapped up on it that's why soap operas are so addictive because you're showing everyday life but of course there's some people who didn't like this which leads me to my oh shit I forgot that's the option of object of tension in my uh, in my thing it's a wine glass which leads us to epic theatre which was a style of theatre coined by Bertolt Brecht which is a really great idea but I'm not sure if it really ever worked it was basically Brecht was sick and tired of this huge boom of realism that was happening um, this was post World War II yes and the and he didn't want things where the audience just mindlessly got into it he wanted a theatre, because he was a socialist, he wanted a, th <laughs> a theatre where the um, audience took away messages from, from the play in a very active manner. So as a result, he got all of the traditions that realism had set up in a reaction to travelling shows and Commedia dell'arte and the like, and just fucking smashed them down again. It was great. So. This was his main core like philosophy, it was called the Verfremdungs effect. Yeah. And it was it was also known as the alienation effect in German. That's what it is in German. And so it's basically a distancing of the play and the characters from the audience, where you can't sympathize with the characters, but you can empathize with them. And so as a result, um, he'd have stuff like the characters wouldn't talk to each other, but they wouldn't really talk to the audience, they might talk to, like, the floor. And then also, all this beautiful tension that realism, like, strove to, like, capture and make, uh, and make it really engaging. Brecht just went ahead and whenever there was a tense moment, he just broke it with a song. Every time. You see stuff like any, like, the romances broken with a song all the time, and the song will always be, um... So the song might, uh, might be by a chorus. He was very, he was a huge fan of Greek theatre, so he used the chorus a lot. And he also um, uh, would occasionally wear masks because the masks distanced yourself from the from the character. So as a, um, and so there was a shit ton of stuff like that. And oh yeah, he's a socialist. <laughs> um, and because he was a socialist, don't say. I know, I know. And because he was a socialist, these plays often had a very socialist message. He, he used something called gestus, I guess gestus in German, where you'd, um, where other characters would have a very clear, like, social, um, higher status over a different character. So, for example, no, wait, that's the Greek chorus. For example, there we go. That's gestus, as an example. A very simplified version of gestus. But, don't think for one second that the poor people got like, you know, everybody everybody could be allowed to see the poor person and be like, oh, poor per poor person, am I right? And then go back into the culinary theatre thing that Brecht despised. No, he made a very very flawed um, he made flawed characters, and they were always shown to be flawed because of their society. So, for example, wait, flawed characters. Okay, so. For example, Mother Courage and Her Children. Mother Courage, this was a play that was set during the Thirty Year War, I think? It was, and it was basically a re, um, about this woman with a cart, and she had a bunch of, she had a bunch of kids. One of them went off, off to war. One, um, I don't think he ever came back. One was shot by some soldiers. Spoilers, by the way. Spo spoilers! <laughs> and um, oh, another shit. one was also... Wait, since he was shot, should it also be trigger warning? Right, yes. <laughs> so, all... all <laughs> so, all the... Basically all of her kids died. And oh. you'd, you'd think... You, yeah, exactly. So your first, your first <laughs> thing <laughs> is... Nice. Your, your first thing is, oh, poor mother courage kind of thing. But no, Brecht doesn't want you to do that. Rick, you're not doing what Brecht wants here. <laughs> so what he does is, um, at the he when as each of her kids die, of course she reacts, but she re reacts in ways that aren't as sympathetic. Shh, that aren't as sympathetic. <laughs> so for exa um, example, a famous moment is when 
her kid, Swiss cheese, get shot multiple times. Oh my god. I know. Um, <laughs> and, 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 so, and, like, and so she has a, there's this moment where she turns away and she does a silent scream. But it's silent. So you don't see any, you don't get to connect quite as much because it's not raw. It's just that, and then she'll go back and um, and she'll go back to her old self. When her when her daughter dies, she um, she bargains in order to, um, and pays the uh, people in order to bury her daughter. And by the end, she's she's still saying, "Well, it's back to business and dragging her car around because she profits from from the war, profiting from the war, capitalism." Everybody is a servant. Illuminati. So, <laughs> so three kids died. Exactly. That's, so basically, yeah, all all of, all of Brecht's heroes heroes aren't heroes. They're all very very flawed because we have to because the aim of his stuff isn't to look at it and go, oh that's sad or oh that's crazy. It's to go, oh. Oh, that's kind of wrong, hey. Oh, how's what? What's your? Oh God, kind of thing. <laughs> and admittedly, like some of his stuff, um, for example, just completely distancing yourself from the audience, um, is is debated to just be like bad, bad theater, basically, because then nobody can relate. But it's an interesting concept, and that's why I like break the law. Yeah. Go see Mother Courage at Belvoir. It's probably not going to be very Brechtian, but you know. Um, so, now we get to absurdism. And it's taking an absurdly long time to do that because I have set it to like 30 long. seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, absurdism is yet another kind of reaction to realism and also to World War II. And there were different movements of absurdism in philosophy and art as well as theatre. But the interesting thing about absurdism for me, and wh why a lot of people don't like it or love it, is because there's no plot. Um, and you might be saying, but neither. If there's no plot, how is it interesting? Well, it's random. Not, that's your answer. How dare you? <laughs> well, um, an absurd, um, absurdist plays um, are basically, while, while realism is about showing hopelessness in a seemingly hopeful environment, absurdism is about characters finding hope in a completely hopeless environment. So that's uh, so as a result, they essentially, if you try to explain the plot of any absurdist play to somebody. You, you basically can't. Like, waiting for Godot, there's a guy called Godot that these two people are waiting for. Some other people turn up. Basically. Like, that's... And, and that doesn't sound like a very interesting plot. But they entertain the audience through, through comedy. A lot of the characters are very kind of stereo, um, stereotypical and influenced by Commedia dell'arte and, the, and that kind of thing. Um, and they'll generally also be in pairs. So, like an unlikely couple, for example, um, Vladimir and Estragon in Waiting for Godot. And they'll, um, there'll also be a lot of messing around with words, a lot of um, them not understanding each other, a lot of gobbledygook, and that, was, and that was supposed to kind of show the meaninglessness of life and how we pathetically try to find meaning in it, which was really cool and nice and happy. So. For example, here's some good. Here's a good use of language. Whoa! This is Lucky's monologue from Waiting for Godot. I can't. I'm sorry that I'm only using Waiting for Godot as an example. There's also a lot of other good ones, like Chairs by UNESCO is a very good observer's play. But you know, this is, this is the one that everyone knows. Qua qua qua. So this is qua. Lucky is a character that it's debated. Kind of shows like the working class and stuff when you come comes in, he's being whipped by um, this other guy, and he basically doesn't talk throughout the whole thing, but all the other characters do. And ev eventually, he has a hat, and eventually um, they try and get Lucky to do this trick, where they, he puts on the hat, and they go, think, Lucky, think! And this is what he says! This goes longer than the slide. This goes, like, down here, but you can't see it. Um, and it's just this kind of utter nonsense um, is 
is something that's very characteristic of observism. And it's also why observism is generally, I'd say it's pretty hard to do. Because if you do it well, you do it amazingly well. But if you do it not very well, it's like, given the existence as other forth through the works of God, you know, whatever. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very interesting style of theatre, I think. And because it's a, a play, which is supposed to be about something, about nothing. And that's what I like about it. So there you go. So after this, like, Ray blowdown, um, we get to kind of modern theatre. There's like other styles as well, but we're gonna just skip them. The so modern theatre, um, you get a lot of you get a lot of different interpretations, and that's the beauty that's the beauty of theatre really. When you go to a movie, you can probably remake the movie, but you a play you can remake just by yourself with a couple of friends, and you can do it in infinite various different versions, especially Shakespeare which a lot of people do. For example, in this is, a, this is an example of how um, actors can interpret, interpret lines differently. So this is a line from the Scottish play. Uh, it says, it's where Macbeth goes, but what if we fail? This is when he's arguing with Lady Macbeth about stuff. And he goes, but what if we fail? And she goes, we fail. But then she starts going on about, oh, but if you you screw your courage to a sticking point, it's okay, you can be, um, we'll be fine, be a man about it, man, 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 man. But the thing about we fail is that it can be said in like a plethora of different ways. You can, you can say it really hesitantly, like, we fail? Or you can say it like, what, the, what are you talking about, like, we fail? Or you can say, uh, say it like she actually believes that you're going to fail, like, we fail. We fail. You can say it so many times in different ways, and and that's just like one line in a play. So, and so that's a, so as a result, you can make th stuff basically about whatever you want, and that's a um, a lot of people complain about that, like oh you're obscuring the true meaning of the playwright, but that's 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 really just bullshit. That was the meaning of the playwright. Because yeah, yeah exactly. Point, meaning, if you want to think beside it, saying say sad. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, the, the, some of the best theatre is stuff, I think, that it is interpreted in a different way. Which is why I'm a huge fan of the of theatre, uh, of movie interpretations as well as theatre interpretations. Like Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet, and like Ten Things I Had About You, which is uh, um, based off the Taming of the Shrew. So, these both took Admittedly, Ten Things I Had About You was just an adaptation. It didn't actually use Shakespearean language or the script. But both of those are ways to just try and get a play that's, you know, centuries old and then just try and refresh it for a modern audience while still showing the stuff. Like if you look at, if you still look at Romeo and Ju Juliet, Baz Luhrmann's, what I like about it most is that it's just ridiculous. The opening scene is absolutely, it's so quick. Everybody's being an idiot. And that's what the play's about. <laughs> so, that's, so as a result, there's a lot of movie adaptations. But the other interesting thing about is that it's not just like the actors and it's not just the directors who can make stuff interesting. Um, it's also playwrights. For example, Stoppard uses um, kind of a blend of different stuff in his plays. Stoppard, by the way, wrote Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, which has a lot of absurdist elements. But, like, I wouldn't say you completely call it observist. You, um, it's not and then there's also stuff like Real Inspector Hound. Um, and stuff like that. There's also a lot, there's a lot of semi-observist works out there that are just, they're not, they still might have a plot. For example, Ruby Moon has a plot, but it's also cyclical. And it also, um, and although stuff happens in it, it's, it, it's, ultimately to no avail. So playwrights blend together different things from different um, styles, which is very interesting. And also um, they all blend together different stuff in terms of sets. So, oh, I'm supposed to replace that with a different one because it doesn't necessarily have to have a detailed set or not. But Ruby Moon, this um, production of Ruby Moon has what I'd say is a pretty realistic set. It's quite detailed and it's quite um, 
realistic. It looks like a living room in somebody's house. So <coughs> contrast this to Callum Hotten Roof. Callum Hotten's Roof is ultimately a realist play, but this Belvoir production basically just had the streamers and then like at one point there was a table, it was a revolving st um, stage, so some you didn't see the props until the stage rolled, um, rolled around. But it was ultimately a very stark set, which is not at all, like if you read any really, was it Williams? I think it was Tennessee Williams who wrote Calvin Hobson Roof. If you read any of his plays, his, his stage directions are so meticulous and so very detailed, they go on for pages. But this isn't what they did here at all, they just got a very minimalist set instead and it created I'd say a different effect, um, especially like during moments of tension, they had the streamers fall down at one point, and then the next act was just, just remnants of everything that happened. Because in in realism, um, the tension eventually has to break, and um, so they used that with the streamers to create a completely different kind of effect and a less realistic one. So yeah, those are examples of um, just. Ways modern theatre is interpreted um, classical classical genres of theatre and more modern styles of theatre and how everything's kind of amalgamated together and that's what I really like about theatre um, especially versus movies but on the other hand there's some things that theatre used to do well and doesn't do very well very um, anymore for example it's accessibility it's so generally theatre that's put on by any companies that aren't amateurs. A very, it's very expensive, and as a, res as a result it can be seen as quite a class thing, which is not, um, I don't think, the point of theatre, especially if you look at stuff like Brecht, which is really about showing political statements um, to the workers. Um, if you look at, later on, there's also playwrights like Dario Fo who do similar things, and so if you're just showing it to the upper class, there's no, there's no point in those kind of plays. But, yeah, so with that in mind, also theatre, like astronomy, shout out to that other guy, um, is very, um, is pretty underfunded, like most arts, because there's no real point to it, it's just a thing that people watch, and also people have movies now. Um, who needs the theatre? Yeah, who needs the theatre? So basically, what I was just going to leave you with, wow, this is 45 minutes, I'm sorry, um, it is... What is the purpose of theatre today, do you guys think? And uh, is there a purpose? Do you, uh, what do you, what do you guys think? Go. Really good place to take a date. Good, good point. I feel you. The, definitely. And then you get fancy ice cream afterwards. Yeah. Mm. This is a good, good self-discussion topic. Everyone, if you have a date, take them to the theatre. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> Pick your shows well, though. Yeah, like, yeah. Some, yeah. Some, and pick yeah. pick your boyfriends and girlfriends and non-binary cuties well because <laughs> <laughs> non-binary cuties is my new favorite phrase. Because <laughs> you know you don't you don't want somebody yelling like, "Wow!" when somebody's naked on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. What do you guys think is the purpose of theatre today? What do you think? What do you like about it? What do you not like about it? Has anyone seen a piece of theatre in theatres? Hella good, sweet as. Um, what did you guys see? Do you guys think it goes into any of those categories that I just showed you? I've seen a lot of musical theatre. And it's that is musical theatre, but okay. I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Less there strange. are a lot of there are a lot of elements. There are a lot of times that songs are used in um, normal theater as well, yeah. like Brecht. Does and James and the Giant Peach count? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> counts. Always, Roldo always counts. You're beautiful. Okay. I think well, I saw a historical done by Bell Shakespeare. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Which which one did you see? Oh, uh, it was Henry. 
We, one of the, yes. we ended up... <laughs> Shit, I meant I meant <laughs> It was in Canberra two-ish years? Oh god. Oh, oh yeah, no, I seem to remember that. I didn't go and see it, but I seem to remember well, one of the I think it was Henry V. Yes, um, but the lead actor used to go to our school, so I'm like, this seems like a good one to go to. Nice. We got pictures with her. Power. Well, yeah. as you know, that's a historical play yeah. in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. The more you know. The more yeah, in case anybody's can afford it and then wants to go see Sydney Sydney stuff. Um, there's a play, a production of Malik Courage, which is by Brecht. So we, you can see it and be like, does this follow Brechtian conventions or not? Nah? <laughs> um, and that's on later. And I've got a pretty good. Are there any up. good realist stuff uh, things coming out? I believe there's a Chekhov on at Sydney Theatre with Kate Blanchett. And Chekhov's a realist playwright, so you're gen so... He likes his guns. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's another thing about realism. <laughs> guns. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I like theatre because you can kind of connect to it more than you can... Oh, that's not. That's I true. Especially, in, especially when characters do... Um, when both ones when people switch cheese. Yeah. <laughs> when they kill when they kill off people and alienate yeah. the audience. I think that's the two biggest things for me are the uniqueness and the iniquity and the risk. Both mm. of those things. Because like the show that you're seeing will never be seen by any other audience ever. That's true. It's, Unless like, it's taped like the National Theatre or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also um like it could go wrong. Yeah. It yeah, could, that's true. It could screw up. It's such a good collaboration between, like, I haven't really talked about the different roles between stage people, but, like, the actors, the director, the yeah. producer, everyone is just, like, Such you know, effort. It's everybody mm. working together, which in the Middle East movies as well, but, like, it's everyone's working together every night, with the exception of the playwright, who just chills. Right. <laughs> 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 Like on the, on the topic of theatre today though, like my experience in musical theatre was always that the, the people who came to see it were the people who did theatre. Mm. Like, which is it? It was either the people who did theatre or like people who liked the idea of theatre but never saw theatre. Yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, I think it has become less public. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Especially like, and also sometimes like, the themes get a bit too like caught up so people don't understand them anymore, especially with Shakespeare. Mm. Like in um all I'm thinking of right now is when I went to see Waiting for Godot at Sydney Theatre a while back and after the first act ended, somebody behind me went, Oh they're waiting for someone <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> But yeah. If the XSA were a play, what kind of play would it be? Oh. Absurdism. Absurdism. Yeah, so yeah. Exactly. So absurdism. One hundred percent. Yeah. That's it. Wait, to be honest. The XSA gives you hope. <laughs> no, no. XSA is hopeless. We we're trying no, we're, to find no, hope. We're building in a hopeless. We're building. Place. We're building. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, a lot of a lot of absurdist things are just in like one. And actually, so realists are just in one setting because it's easier to not move the shit around in the case of realism. And in, ca in the case of absurdism, nothing happens, so the setting doesn't change. Mm. They, um, chairs, for example, is at a dining party where they've got, it's these couple entertaining guests, but none of the guests are there, there's just chairs and like, when you've got to basically, the only thing that's I think on the stage is there's a tree, and with one and uh, in this, by the second act it's growing a leaf and they freak out because something's different. <laughs> <laughs> so you know stuff like that. I think absurdism is actually weirdly close to real life. <laughs> like, like, there's no plot. I mean, not real. No, it's not no weirdly plot. because I think that's kind of the point. You see, you see stuff. It's a mirror up to life, most of it. In some way or another. Could that be a purpose, mirroring life and showing it a different perspective? Yeah, I'd say yeah, exactly. It's interesting that, like you say, you know, we've got movies now, and yeah, we do, and that detracts from people's desire to see theatre. Mm. But it's not like movies do the same thing theatre does by mm. like, any means. Like they haven't just it isn't just theatre on screen. Yeah, exactly. It's totally different in its intentions and it's like yeah, there's a whole different. And it's 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 got a different dimension as well in terms of the uh, shots. 
um, yeah, shot side, and the um, and how how you act, for example. Mm. Um, acting is way more subdued in theatre because it can be. You've got microphones, yeah. whereas theatre is like, what's that over there? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, stuff like that. Is there, is there you know, questions, comments? Anyone? Hey, um, I'm getting hot. Hey! Too bad. Please give me a lift from someone.